chapter 10.0111, Full Swing, by Sky. Once the party got going, Blizzard introduced Frank and Ben to a large group of ghosts. They were hovering around Blizzard, hoping to receive a magic gift that would give them back their bodies while the party was on. That way they could enjoy eating and drinking as much as they liked. Thank you, came the enormous shout of joy as each ghost swooped about, grabbing party food, toasting blizzard, toasting life, toasting death, and loudest of all, toasting the birthday girls. They were by far the wildest and happiest bunch at the party. Minnow said, pinch me please, I want to know that all of this is actually happening. I pinched her, but only gently. It's happening, I said, and it's the best birthday party ever. The best birthday eve party, said Six. Definitely the best birthday eve party, I said, picking up Six and twirling her around. Oh, look, said Minnow, there's going to be music. A group of musicians were setting up on the beach and one of them was Decca, our beloved music teacher from school. Minnow and I ran across to him. Minnow shouted, Decca, are you from Moreskama? He laughed. What do you think? Yes! Minnow and I jumped onto the stage and hugged Decca. This is going to be a killer party, said Decca. So good, shouted Minnow. Decca laughed and started playing Blister in the Sun. All along the beach, everyone jumped up. Blister in the Sun, shouted Jax as she swooped by with Blizzard. Esha and Solo were dancing wildly with Six and Jem, and Stella ran over to grab me. Frank, Ben and Minnow formed a trio and we cavorted down the beach and into the water. It was so warm that before too long we were all doing a wild splashing dance. Some mer people came into the shallows and joined in, jiving all around us. Then a school of dolphins sped right up to me inviting me to swim with them. I felt as if I'd morphed into a dolphin, but as far as I could tell, I was still human. Back on the beach, the band was playing a song about heroes and dolphins swimming. I could hear it so clearly, even though I was way out to sea, and I felt like I would burst with happiness. It was the song my parents had chosen for their wedding. After the longest time, the dolphins led me back to shore. I lay in the shallows as waves of some sort of electricity flowed through my veins. With the electricity came little messages of happiness. I can't describe it any better than that. It was as though I'd become an honorary dolphin. Huge platters of food were delivered to the tables lining the water's edge and we all ate and drank to our heart's content. Six showed Jem how to morph into a bird and of course Jem chose to be a tiny pink and emerald hummingbird. The falcon and the hummingbird flew wildly in and around the party guests, only transforming back into their human form occasionally to eat. Little girls can get much more food into their mouths than tiny birds. For a few of the band's songs, Frank played guitar with Decca and Minnow took over playing drums. She totally owned the drum kit, earning a com commendation from Jax, Solo and Esher. Minnow was beaming from ear to ear after that. The night ended with everyone making an enormous noise with a huge amount of gongs. The gongs appeared from nowhere, but Jax told us later that the gongs are always in the ether, ready to appear whenever they're needed. They helped the air to leap and dance for joy. Finally, at midnight, we were treated to a fireworks display. Across the night sky sparkled Happy Birthday Minnow and Sky and Six and Jemima and Moat. After all that, a gigantic 11.11 .11 blazed up into the air and reflected down into the ocean. It was beautiful. How did that happen? asked Minnow. The physics of enchantment, said Jax. We don't use real fireworks because we can replicate the look. Wasn't it the best? So good, said Minnow. 
I smiled, loving Jax and her magic. We all went to bed, tired and sandy, but so deeply happy. Of course we all slept in. Darling was taking care of Moat, so there was nothing to disturb us. When Minnow and I finally woke up, it was eleven, eleven. Look at the clock, said Minnow. Eleven, eleven. Our number, I said with a smile. Our number, said Six and Jemima lazily. Happy birthday, said Jax, putting a big tray of breakfast on the table in our treehouse. Yum, said Six, always ready for food. Minnow laughed. So good, she said. We all helped ourselves and then snuggled together in bed, munching on croissants and jam made from enchanted fruit. I've made each of you a birthday dress, said Jax, holding up some shimmering fabric. Well, they don't have to be dresses. They're magical costumes, which can become anything you want. A dress, trousers, shorts, a coat, pyjamas. Six looked like she was about to explode. Magic clothes, she asked. Esha told me about his magical cloak. It turns into anything he wants. Exactly, said Jax. You simply get dressed and make a wish. The colours and styles can change as many times as you like. For, for different shoes, simply wipe your magic clothes across them and imagine what you want. Jax beamed at us. You like? she asked. We love, shouted Six. We all hugged Jax before donning our magic clothes and wishing our hardest. Six moved quickly from court jester to an Alice in Wonderland dress before finally settling on a strange ball gown with a silver crown. You're off to the golden house on the island of Meteora, said Jax. Six immediately closed her eyes and wished for her crown to be gold. Then she wiped her shoes and her gown and they became golden as well. Darling arrived with Moat who looked all bright and happy. Six waved Moat's little outfit with her ball gown and wished for the little baby to have an astronaut suit. We all laughed. Well done, said Jax. Darling curved her beak into the most wonderful smile, still holding Moat who was gurgling. The island of Meteora, I said my eyes sparkling. I can't wait to see it. Much as I didn't want to say farewell to Six and Jem or Little Moat, I did wonder if Meteora was where Angel would put me together again. I was getting desperate for the effect of the time virus to end. I didn't want to tell anyone but I'd started to feel weak most of the time and I wanted to be myself again. Come on, said Jax. Wish yourselves some birthday finery. We'd better head off. Once we were all dressed to perfection, we waited for Blizzard on Angel's balcony. Minnow and I had wished for matching indigo tunics with dark red trousers underneath. We gave ourselves high fives, so happy to have imagined the same outfits. Jem finally settled on a navy blue ball gown. Six insisted that we all have golden crowns and slippers for our birthday. Ben and Frank ran onto the balcony. Good, said Ben, out of breath. You're still here. We've been dressing, I said. Magic clothes. I wished for my costume to be covered with diamonds for a moment and then for the diamonds to disappear. Wow, said Ben and Frank, suitably impressed. Happy birthday, said Ben, giving me a hug. Thank you, I said. I hope you'll be back together soon, whispered Ben. I'm going to miss the little ones, but it'll be good to have you well again. I smiled, feeling a pang of sadness. They'll always be with us, I whispered, and I have this secret hope that Mum and Dad might come back when I'm together again. Me too, said Ben. I got you this. Ben handed me a small gift wrapped in indigo paper and tied with a big red ribbon. Inside was a little brooch inscribed with a flying fish. Jax helped me make it, said Ben. It's to remind you that your wings will grow back. I hugged Ben. Oh, thank you, I said, 
pinning the brooch onto my tunic. It's wonderful, and even more so because you and Jax made it. Ben grinned. This is from Darling, he said, handing me a pink parcel. Inside was a blue beanie. The card said, Yours was lost, so I knitted you a new one. Love from Darling. X for kisses. P.S. I hope you like it. I almost burst into tears, but instead I whispered to Ben, Please tell her how much I love the beanie. Ben nodded. She made one for all of us, he said, even Frank. Frank had a big smile on his face as he stepped forward to give Minnow a hamper. Happy birthday, he said. It's magic fruit, mostly black cherries, because Solo and Escher say they're good for courage. They're for all of you. Frank gave Minnow a big hug. Thank you, said Minnow. Chapter 10.01111 The Journey to Meteora by Sky. As we were talking, Blizzard pulled up next to the balcony in a replica of one of the hot air balloons I'd imagined in the Noesis. It had orange and white stripes. With him was Decker. We couldn't help squealing with delight. Decker! Happy birthday, he said. Sorry I couldn't tell you about Mareskamar when we were at Lowood. We all laughed. No matter, I said. We're here now. Decker, said Minnow, jumping into the balloon and giving him a hug. Did you bring your guitar? What do you think? asked Decker with a grin. We have gongs too. Gongs, said Minnow, looking up where Decker was pointing. Hanging down inside the balloon were three big gongs, their bronze shimmering in the sun. We can make the best noise as we float across the sky, said Blizzard. Decker and I are both masters of the gong. Excellent, said Minnow, picking up two padded mallets and doing a roll around the edge of one of the gongs to build up a slow, long, crashing sound. Happy birthday to us, she shouted. All the way to Meteora, we took it in turns to make the gongs hum and crash. Decker played his guitar and we all sang loudly. Minnow used her hands to drum on the side of the balloon's basket. Floating through the noesis, we sang Because I Love You and Decker dubbed us the Master's Mini Apprentices because he said we were so good. We all held our breath as we got closer to Meteora. It's the island of time that's closest to Ephinox, the main diamond-shaped island, and it's stunning. On top of the island of Meteora is a forest which encircles a beautiful glistening lake. At the centre of the lake is a golden house and on our birthday its domed roof was shining in the sun and reflecting across the lake like a happy fire. I loved it and felt that whatever happened in that house could only be good. Okay, said Blizzard, this is where you, we need to leave you. Your first visit to the Golden House needs to be taken by you and yourselves alone. All right, I said, feeling a little anxious. Are we going to be put together again? asked Six. I'm not sure, I said. I hope not, said Six, tears in her eyes. I'll miss you. I frowned. Let's see, I said. It might not be today. Six smiled tearfully and carried Moat as we walked up to the house and knocked on the big golden door. Jem held my hand, looking frightened. Welcome, said a ma male angel. Do come in. The hallway was gleaming with a soft golden light and music wafted towards us. In the wide room at the end of the hall, we could see a man sitting on a chair. He was staring out at the lake. As we approached, he turned to look at us. You're here, he said. My heart sank. The man in the room was Miguel. Hello, I said, but I couldn't hide my disappointment. He looked a bit grumpy, and I'd been so excited about seeing Angel. You don't sound very happy for a birthday girl, said Miguel. 
We were expecting angels, said Six. She's still away, said Magal. She asked me to fill in. I see, I said. I knew that I probably sounded rude, but I felt a bit upset. Magal just sat there staring. Aren't you going to offer us a seat? I asked. My apologies, I'm not very good at the niceties of life. Magal clapped his hands and a long couch appeared. It was covered in pink feathers and looked like something Darling would, might dream up. There, he said, sounding cross. Pretty enough for you? Why would a seat need to be pretty? I asked. Magal groaned, changing the couch to dark blue feathers. Better? he asked. I shrugged, settling onto the couch. I'm just saying that a couch doesn't have to be pretty, that's all. Right, said Magal, still sounding gruff, and then he noticed Moat. Do we have to have the baby here? What if it starts screaming? Jem frowned and said, she's part of us and she doesn't scream. Magal shook his head, seeming to get more and more impatient. We'd better start, he said. I have some questions for you. Six whispered something into my ear. It was a good idea, so I nodded and whispered the same thing to Jemima. On the count of three, I said. One, two, three, said Six. At that moment, all three of us wished for our magic clothes to turn into the shining armour that knights wear. Of course, we'd selected gold for our birthday. We left Moat as she was in her little astronaut suit. Under our helmets, we had a sheath of gold mesh. On the count of three, we opened up our visors and stared at Magal. The metal mesh felt cold against my face and the stiffness of the armour was strange. But we felt much more ready to speak to Magal now, we now that we were all suitably dressed. You may start, I said. Right, said Magal, not commenting on our magic armour. I felt cross with him, but decided not to show it. Magal looked a little impatient. Please remember that this was Angel's idea, not mine, he said. I raised my eyebrows before asking, What are the questions? Magal stared at me calmly. Question one. What would be the best possible thing for you right now if you could have anything? I looked at Six and Jemima and thought about Magal's question. Six and Jemima smiled, both thinking as hard as they could. Moat stirred but didn't cry. I didn't know why, but Magal's question seemed to sit in the air like a shimmering disco ball spinning around, slowly sending out little sparkles. I felt as if the question was the most important thing I'd ever been asked. I closed my eyes, wondering what might be the very best thing to happen. It felt good to wonder about it. With my eyes closed, I thought about my life and began to see many episodes for the from the past few years. Bad, terrible, Good. After a long while, Magal asked, Your answer? I still felt a bit uncertain, but I said, The best thing right now would be that none of the horrible things that have happened to me or to my family had ever happened. I stared at Magal. You want the past erased? he asked. I want the things caused by the time virus to be erased, I said. Then I'd be living happily at home with my family. All right, said Magal, his eyes unmoved by any sort of pity. I glared at him. All right, I asked, shaking my head. It's not all right. No, it's not all right, said Magal, but we need to continue. I frowned at Magal. Don't you care? Magal sighed. Of course I do, he said. But we need to continue, I said, feeling grumpy.